Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I feel like it's a Monday, but it's not. Don't worry. Um, I've just been off the first couple of days this week, enjoying some extended Fourth of July holiday. We are so thrilled to have you back here at the Nonprofit Show. Julie and I, of course, are here, and we are with our guest, Michael Buckley. That's a CFRE with Kill Low group and I'm so excited to have you with us, Michael, to talk to us about communicating with major donors. And I just have to say, Michael and I met in Vegas um, and we were attending a, a side get together, a little, a little, you know, cocktail and connection with one of our friends and really just glad to have the opportunity to meet you, Michael. And then of course, for you to say yes to being on our show. So thanks for doing that. And before we dive into this conversation with you, we of course want to make sure that our viewers and our listeners know who they're looking at or possibly listening to. Julia Patrick is here. She is a great staple of the nonprofit show, and she is the mastermind behind the nonprofit show. So as the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, Julia, um, again, I just have to say thank you for creating this platform because I love being here with you each and every day to serve alongside as the co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd and CEO of the Raven Group. We are honored to have the continued support of our presenting sponsors. That would be Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy, Staffing Boutique, and the Nonprofit Thought Leader. You know, we're coming up on our 600th episode, and we really have to say Thank you, thank you, thank you to these sponsors because they keep us going and growing. You know, Julia, we used to say national, but we're really international now. And as we were just talking about Ireland, right? Like at some point, I have a feeling we're going to be broadcasting from there. So Michael, maybe you'll be there as well. (laughs) Count me in. I'm honored to be here today, but I would really love to be there. So yes, absolutely. Well, if you missed any of our episodes or you know that you like what you're hearing and you want to share it with your friends, your colleagues, your board members, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, as well as Vimeo plus podcasts. So if you're a podcast listener like I am, you can queue up the nonprofit show and listen to us. We're still working on that hologram, right, Julia, where someone just says the nonprofit show and we show up like in the flesh um, or in the digitized, you know, version, but really excited so that we have this free uh, platform for all of you to enjoy and experience. Um, They live forever. These recordings live forever. So check them out. But again, enough about us. Let's move into our guest. I'm so excited, Michael Buckley, to have you. And you are a CFRE, which for those of you that are scratching your heads, what does that mean? It's a certified fundraising executive. And so again, you bring a lot of great insight in particular when it comes to fundraising, interacting with donors. And you also are the founder of the Killo Group. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Michael. Hi, thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here. Mike Buckley uh, with the Colo Group. I have been a career nonprofit fundraiser and I'm really passionate about the field. I think uh, the work we do to help advance uh, nonprofit organizations either in our community or locally or globally or whatever uh, is really important. So really happy to be here today. I am a proud former student phone-a-thon caller, which is how I got my uh, nonprofit career start. My parents are still not sure what I do for a living, but um, they they know it's working. Uh, But anyway, so uh, just so thrilled to be here helping organizations really make smart, effective decisions and communicating with major donors. I know we'll get into that definition in a moment, but I think how we communicate with donors can really uh, grow long-term sustainable relationships to advance the work of uh, our organizations. Amazing. You know, I love that you mentioned the uh, the college phone-a-thon. I was a part of that. that. We'll have to do a poll to find out how many of our guests served in that capacity, because it tells, it says a lot about us, I think, but I love that. So today you're going to talk to us really about, you know, how we can communicate with our major donors, but let's start with a baseline. What the heck is a major donor? Like, let's start at that bottom, bottom rung. Tell us in maybe even define Mike, if you would, like, what is a major donor? So for me, I always say a major donor is what you believe it to be. And I think that that's probably a, um, 
an easy way out of answering that question. <laughs> but I'll tell you, when I worked in higher education, major donors were $25,000 and above. That was the definition. Uh, a lot of my work after higher ed was in animal welfare, both uh, working in it and consulting in it. And major donors to animal welfare is, you know, a thousand five hundred to a thousand dollars. So um, I think too often we talk about major donors and we exclude folks who have that potential uh, based on what we might believe to be true. So uh, while major donors, I think, are important, they're certainly important. It's important to have a definition in your head. All donors deserve the same type of communication and the same uh, type of interaction. Wow, that's a great, great way to define kind of what we're looking at, because I think a lot of times, you know, smaller organizations or newer organizations will say, oh, well, we don't have major donors. Yeah, and yeah I think leave it at that. I, I think we're all major donors. I also say to folks, to board members and, and staff when we're con doing consulting work, they think about your own personal philanthropy. You know, we're all donors. And what a major, what a impactful, you know, stretch gift is for me is probably, is definitely going to be different than other people. So think about how you want to be treated and leave the dollar amount out of it. Yeah. You know, Mike, I have to add, and I've shared this on the show before, but I alluded, I didn't allude, I said, <laughs> I just, I just flat out said it uh, to a major donor of an organization where I was working uh, with that she was a major donor. And she goes, oh gosh, no, 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 no. Like, thank you. But my $5,000 really doesn't do that much, I'm sure. And I was like, she has no idea that she is a major donor. And I remember having this conversation and I thought, should I have told her that? And, you know, in the moment I was like, oh gosh, what did I do wrong? But then I really realized what a great opportunity it was to say, your impact of $5,000 is in fact a major, major donor level with this organization. But it also told me, Michael, she has the capacity for way more. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. And think about impact and outcomes. I mean, we, we nice. talk about that a lot in, in our work as nonprofit professionals, but it, it, you know, it's almost like ROI. If you have a $5,000 donor that's got a high level of ROI to your organization, they should be treated as a major donor. And that might make people feel uncomfortable, but realistically, and you're absolutely right, that says to me, there's a lot more capacity there. So yeah. let's build a stronger relationship and, and help them get there. Yeah, that's certainly what I heard. I was like, <laughs> okay, okay. So we need to increase the giving here. But again, just, just a great opportunity. Well, you mentioned the relationship and I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit, Mike, about you know the importance of these in-person visits. And I know that a lot of this has you know gone into this digital space. We're very comfortable meeting in a digital space now. Um, sometimes even old school with a telephone. This, this is what a telephone looks like, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, dial. what yeah, the, the, the rotary, right? Um, but tell us a little about, about the importance from your perspective in the in-person opportunities. So the presentation I did um, at ICON was all about how to be a better uh, communicator with donors, how to listen to donors, and how to talk with donors better, really regardless of that level. And, and how do you grow a better, more sustainable relationship? And um, one of the things that I was sort of shocking to me when I was surprising to me, I should say, um, when I was doing the research for the presentation uh, is the amount of nonverbal social cues that exist in one-on-one -on -one communication. It's impossible to get that reaction. It, it's, it's impossible to read someone's reaction on their face when you're on the phone. It's hard to do it on Zoom. It's not impossible, but it's hard to do it on Zoom because you know, we're all in our own environment. We're all, you know, dealing with technology and, and, and all of that. So when it is safe for us to go back to in-person visits, and there's ways to, we can navigate around that right now, but it's really important because almost, I think it's a, a more than half of someone's reaction is, is shown on their face or in their nonverbal uh, cues as compared to what they say. And think about how we deal with that every day in our lives. You know, we pick up 
on not only what people say, but how they react in a nonverbal way. And we've got to do that in person when we're growing relationships with donors. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you said that because I think in, in that process of trying to work with a donor, and then I think a lot of times we psych ourselves out by affixing that moniker major donor it seems like we're worried about what we're going to say and you know are we getting through our script and and then we lose those opportunities to really evaluate what's happening right before us and it takes time i think that's the hard part about our work in the in the donor world major intro whatever you want to call them you know when we're building those individual relationships it takes time to make those connections and i think too often uh, you know, we've all heard horror stories in the nonprofit space of gift officers who have quotas and expectations and visit numbers and all that. Yeah. You know, it it takes a long time to build a relationship. Think about, and I mean, I say this sort of tongue in cheek, but think about how long it was from your first date to the day you married your spouse. You know, it wasn't three things that happened, you know, in a very short period of time. It took a long time yeah. to build that relationship. And that's what we're doing in this space. Except for these reality shows that now they get mm-hmm. married, like <laughs> the yeah. blind date on the spot. But you're, you, I, I totally get it. I subscribe to that as well, right? Like I always say, it's like dating. It's like, you know, you're not going to ask your first date to marry you that night. And so building these relationships is so important. And one thing that Julie and I have mentioned is really, you know, the tenure of a development professional. And it might be, you know, 18 months that this person is in their development space or, you know, place in this organization. So having this relationship transfer, and I'm always a huge proponent too, Mike, for like document, 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 everything needs to be in the donor database, bloomering, right? Like having these notes in there, but how else, you know, do we really build upon these relationships? You talked about the ROI, you talked about, you know, how we can uh, create some effective relationships. What are you seeing? um, And maybe what's changed over these last two and a half to three years that we need to be mindful of? I think it, it, first of all, asking questions. I think that's really important as major gift, as gift officers, as fundraising professionals, whatever we want to call ourselves, I think too often we're focused on telling and sharing our story, which is absolutely important. We want to be telling donors what we're doing, the in, the outcome and the, and the impact our, your gifts are having, but ultimately sharing successes, sharing what the work you're actually doing, but asking questions, asking for donors to react, you know, tell me, what you know, what do you think of our new strategic plan? What do you think of our new uh, priorities? You know, what do you think of the problem we're trying to fix? Um, and I think that builds a more authentic two-way conversation. I think too often we're so, you know, we all love the work we do. We love the organizations we work for. We want to share as much as we can. But too often, I think we stop, we, we fail to ask donors and prospects for their reactions to that. And, you know, you you talked about before, you know, a a donor who didn't see themselves as a major donor. Think about when you're asking donors questions, they're going to tell you what is important to them. What is, um, you know, what makes them become a donor? Ask those questions to build better relationships. You make this sound so simple. And, you know, I know, Julia, you and I, we, we've been in this world a long time as well in this world, really, of, of asking and fundraising. But I have to I have to acknowledge, Mike, and I know you know this, Julia, you know this as well. So many people put the donors like on a pedestal to where they're intimidated to talk to them. They're not quite sure how to go about the conversation. They get really nervous because they know that this person, you know, has a greater capacity. So I'm really curious because um, we, we have a viewer on that let me know this morning they were going to join because this is a topic that is like just so perfect for them. They have an opportunity to meet with so many major donors as they're as they're growing their own organization. So these questions, I think what you just did is like bring it down to something that, as I said, it seems so simple. And these open-ended questions, you know, I love the fact that you said, you know, ask them what they think of your strategic plan. That opens so many avenues for conversation. Yeah. And I think asking donors 
why do you support our organization? I, you know, I am a donor to many organizations at, at different levels. Um, no one via email, via phone, and and let's not, I mean, as as three former phonathon calling nerds, <laughs> let's not forget the power of a phone call. Like yeah. the actual, we can zoom, we can email, we can do all that great stuff. But now when people call my phone, I I I it's like an honor. Like, like people are actually calling to talk to me on the phone. So Call to, whether you're meeting with donors in person, major donors, however, call people and ask them, you know, just very quickly, you're very generous to our organization. Why do you support our organization? And just let the conversation flow from there. You will be amazed at what you hear. They will be long-winded um, conversations. I'll tell you, I shared in Vegas, I'll share very quickly. Uh, my wife uh, went to college on a financial aid scholarship and we uh, got invited to the new president's reception and he did his due diligence and he said to her, why, you know, what what did it mean to you to be able to go here? And that conversation just went in all types of crazy good directions. And me, I knew why he was asking um, because I, I know there's going to be follow up there. But asking donors to tell you their story and authentically listening when they tell you it is is really how you're going to build that strong relationship. That's so good. You know, I, I really feel that so many people put grand tours on the pedestal, right? And they're like, I'm, I'm too intimidated to talk to them. And the same with major donors, because maybe there's a risk of saying something wrong or, you know, not, not saying something at the right place. But I know, you know, really just having these relationships. One thing we've talked to about during these pandemics, plural, is that return on relationship. And so I love that you mentioned the ROI, the return on investment and that return on relationship um, and providing us some qualification, you know, questions for us to ask our donors and it doesn't have to be rocket science. It's it's a simple open ended and let them take the conversation. Um, and then could you speak to us, Mike, about how this then translates right into our donor pipeline and how we might manage this donor pipeline? Um, because this is this is a lot of great opportunity, but but where do we harness this information? Certainly to your point earlier, you want to harness this information somewhere documented so that if we all win the lotto and our successors <laughs> have to come in, that is somewhere. So I always stress the importance of all that interesting anecdotal information yeah. that you may think is not important or is authentic to your relationship with that donor, that needs to go somewhere. Definitely put that in a database, please. Please, God, put that in the database. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, what we're doing is we're qualifying and cultivating by building these authentic relationships. We're asking questions, asking what's important to donors. You know, I, I went to a wonderful college. Financial aid uh, is important to me. Athletics is not. Ask me, you know, ask those questions. And you know that when you come back to me to make a solicitation, you should not be asking me for athletics. You should be asking me for, for financial aid or, or whatever. So um, having that information building that relationship, having that strong information really comes in important, uh, comes in to play in both qualification and cultivation. You're asking the good, right questions, you're answering um, or you're listening uh, when your donors are, are responding. So I think it's really important. You're able to hone in a better um, a more intentive ask if you've built a good relationship along the way. Yeah, I, you know, and the fact that it's not a one size fits all, you know, we, we have our, our good friends fundraising Academy and, and they talk a lot about, you know, how every donor journey, every donor cycle is different. And um, if you go back to your, you know, example of, of marriage, you know, it's not, it's not a one size fits all for any couple. And it's not, it's the same. It's not a one size fits all for any donor. And I think that's important. Um, one thing that I hear and see a lot, Mike, and I'm curious if you do as well, is, you know, an organization engages with a consultant and they think that they're going to bring their golden Rolodex. And as soon as they sign the, on the dotted line, right, like a windfall of money is going to show up. And if you could just speak to, you know, how you work with your clients and maybe the expectations of working with a consultant in this arena. Yeah, I think that, um, 
And that's a whole nother, you know, ethics conversation <laughs> and soapbox conversation for how fundraising is different than sales. And I struggle that we're going down that path. But but anyway, um, you know, your most authentic, your most uh, your your most high capacity, and your most connected donors already exist in your donor database. It drives me crazy when nonprofit organizations, you know, do the free wealth screen with whatever, and they send out their 500 richest donors. It's like, well, if you already knew that, why did you waste that energy? But, you know, capacity is really hard to determine now. You know, it's really hard to, it's really easy to hide your wealth. Um, so building those strong donor relationships, I think, is more important than knowing who has the most money. Just because they have the most money doesn't mean uh, that they're going to give you the most. And I think the consultant's role is to come into the organization and help you craft a strategy to build that stronger relationship with the donors you already have. A lot of my work, as I said, is in animal welfare. Unless you know Ellen or Oprah, they're not going to give to your animal rescue. They're not. So why are we wasting our time um, trying to get to Oprah? Gosh, that is so true. There are so many like, you know, um, in our community, you know, it, there's there's a certain family and it's like, well, well, they have tons of money. Why can't we just ask them? And it's like, well, first of all, get in line. Second right. of all, their, pill their philanthropic pillars are not aligned with your mission. Right. And so just because they have the capacity does not mean that there's a mission alignment and a propensity to give, you know, to that. So that's, that's really interesting. Well, as we wrap up, Mike, I'm curious if you can, you know, shine that crystal ball of yours. I'm sure you have it. And tell us, I know as you're looking for it, you're like, where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah, it's like um, a magic eight ball anyway. <laughs> magic eight ball. And, and, you know, if you would just kind of, um, where do you see major donors going in the next 18 months? In the next 18 months, I think that um, the economy will certainly have an effect on what we are doing. Um, now is the time to build, and, and I feel like a broken record, but now is the time to build those relationships. Whether or not they will give to you at their capacity uh, remains to be seen. I think we're starting to hear of people getting a little bit nervous about what the market's doing and inflation and gas and all that, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to hear from you. And, and going back to your earlier question, during um, the height of the pandemic, which I hope was ago and not, not still now, you know, I think the most successful nonprofit organizations were those that were calling their donors just to say hello and just to tell them that they were still existing. Don't ask for money. Believe it or not, it's okay, it's okay to call donors and not ask for money. I am here to tell you that. And interestingly, so many of those folks were surprised that they weren't being asked for a gift, that they still made a gift. So some <laughs> yes. of the most successful nonprofits you know, in the last year and a half, and I think in the in the future year and a half to two years, will those will be those who just build that relationship and don't make it just about the gift. If we we've got to play the long game, and the long game is not dialing for dollars like we all did. The long game is building that long term relationship. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I agree, and and I think that is um, when you have that mindset. Michael, I feel like those organizations that have embraced that, and that's really a core value, they have deeper relationships with those donors that then become foundational and become sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's, it's so hard when you're looking at the, the bottom line and you're looking at your budgets and you, you work with fear. But if you can step outside of that and say, look, this is a, a long way away from where we are today. How do we navigate that? with our donors and with our community. It's such a healthier way to go. Yeah, yeah it's not it's not sales. It, it is, with all due respect to our friends who do the sales work, this is a long-term strategy. There's a donor journey and you know, we want we want to keep everyone's got a top 3 I think. I think every donor has three pillars to to your comment before. Make sure if you're in that three, you stay in those three and how you stay in is not always asking for money. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that. You know, one of the things uh, we, Julia and I, catch ourselves saying often is there are 1.8 million nonprofits registered in the U.S. And for me, I also want to honor the fact that, you know, everyone has a choice when it 
comes to their donations. And just because they're not giving to you in the top three doesn't mean that we need to, you know, uh, look down our nose at these individuals. It just means that they are in, you know, core value alignment and mission alignment with another organization. And I believe that we should still celebrate their philanthropy in the community at large. And I just love that you mentioned that, Mike, because, you know, maybe that wasn't quite your point, but that's what I, I took yeah. from it as well is there are so many amazing causes out there. And for those individuals that are going to give to annual animal welfare, you know, great. Then there's other individuals that are going to give to education, as you just mentioned, you know, when it comes to, um, to, to, you know, help with scholarships and whatnot. So we really need to honor the donor and their mission alignment. And um, this has just been a great conversation. Again, I knew when we met in Vegas at the AFP um, Icon Conference that you were going to be just a fantastic, you know, wealth of information. So thank you, Michael, for all that you provided us in this short amount of time that goes by too darn quickly. <laughs> it does. No, it's it's great. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it is uh, always, always love to talk. And like you said, this conversation should, could go on forever. So um, thank you. Well, here's Michael, uh, Michael Buckley's information. As a CFRE, he brings a lot of education and, and observation to the table. Founder of the Kilo Group, um, thekilogroup.com is where you can find Michael and learn more about what he and his team do. Really been a fabulous opportunity to get this perspective on major donors, communicating with major donors, and how we need to maybe change our mindset as we move forward um, through an interesting time. Again, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and I have been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jarrett Ransom. So I'm delighted to say um, shares uh, this amazing journey, if you will, of the nonprofit show. We are marching towards 600 episodes. And Jared, you know, I, I remind our viewers and listeners, and I think I remind myself that when I, I look at who our sponsors are, so many of these folks have been with us from the beginning which is really an interesting thing. And it, it kind of speaks to a lot of those things that Michael was talking about, about the relationship and, and how you navigate, you know, working together. And so I wanna make sure that we extend our phenomenal gratitude to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. It's been a great conversation. And as we end our episode today, we really want to remind ourselves, our viewers, and our listeners to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone.